Hello everyone! This is Sarah Berman with Practically Writing. I have a few announcements at the end of the video, so stay tuned for those. It'll be fun! Today we are going to be talking about outlining. I can't even begin to stress exactly how important this is. Now I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking already. I'm not a plotter. You don't have to be. Okay, you do not have to be a plotter to get value out of outlining. So just stay with me on this. So let's dive right into this. Outlining. Outlining is like a skeleton for your book. And sometimes people do the outlining at the beginning and that's like a skeleton on the inside. You know, mammals, birds, reptiles, vertebrates of all kinds. It actually contributes to the way that the final product looks. My skull helps form the shape of my face. Isn't it pretty? On the other hand, some people do outlining afterwards and it works as an exoskeleton. What this means is that it takes all of the ooey gooey insides and gives it form and structure. Either way you go, you can get a better creature, I mean story, if you add the skeleton. I'm going to go through how I do my plotting. Uh, this is going to be very, very basic because this is actually a class I teach. I use a nine point outline. And this means that I make sure that I hit nine major things with every plot. This gives it the story let's go the right way arc like a rainbow okay it's more like a cliff you gotta because the climax this makes sure that i am putting in enough development throughout the story to increase the tension it's making sense things are lining up well i can hint at the things at the beginning that are gonna happen at the end what an outline is not is etched in stone because now I change stuff all the time I really do point number one now this is the section where you establish what the world is like so is it in the modern world is it in a historical world what kind of lives do these people live you know what are they doing with themselves what is their family structure what is their social structure what is the very most important things about their you know immediate society that is going to contribute to their situation. All of these things are important. And no, it does not take a full ninth of the story. These are not by any means supposed to be evenly divided points. You have the setup. So let's call it number one is the setup. Number two is the initiating action. What is it that happens that sends Bob the sword wielder on a quest. What is it that happens that sends Wanda the wizard to, you know, the fires of Mordor? I don't know. Whatever your quest is. You know, what happens to start your story? What happens to kick this person who has an established life in the butt and move them on? And this can happen in the second sentence. Again, we're not talking about evenly divided. If you can establish a world and kickstart the action at the same time, you go with your bad self. But they have to happen. Number three is the beginning of the main part of the story. This is when you establish kind of the, the rut of the quest. You know, this is what happens. This is how they go about doing things. You know, uh, your love interests have met and now they bicker back and forth because you know it's in the middle of the book they haven't you know truly fallen in love or realized their one true destiny is with each other or you know, whatever or you have you know somebody who's bitten by a werewolf and now they're kind of you know getting used to their new powers or you know whatever this is where you kind of like relax into like the main journey of the story because the main journey it's hard, but let's face it, you, you find that, that groove, you find that rut, and that's where you're going. 
obviously, you don't want to live in a rut. So once you establish that groove, you got to shake them out of it. This is where you get to point number four. This is what is called the midpoint. Okay, so hero's journey, you know, plot outlining, things like that. Describe the midpoint as that point when your character makes a realization. You know, sort of breaks through that first barrier. Or pulls their head out their butt. But it's like, you know, you have a first major success, you have a first major of what happens to this character that really makes them kind of embrace who they've become. Maybe not fully, but they're starting to get there. It's that breakthrough that happens where you can see where the story is going to go. And point number five is this person, they've got, you know, a new life that they're living because they're on this quest or they've got new powers or whatever, blah, blah, blah. They have started to embrace it and, you know, they kind of relax into that situation. They, they grow in that situation. They learn the force, Luke. They, you know practice flying because they're now a vampire and if you were a vampire you'd totally practice flying i mean come on you you kind of settle into that new situation see where i'm going with this you have a situation of settling and then something happens and then you settle and then something happens and then you settle this is how you get the the kind of sine wave okay gradually moving up sine wave sine wave of action within a story things happen and then you have to kind of back off or else people are gonna like their heads are gonna explode their hearts are gonna explode you have to kind of relax back into that situation and give them time to process that fully part six is when you have sort of the major slap in the face so in the hero's journey you have like this whole situation where Oh, they think they're great, and then they hit a boss, and that boss just smacks them down, and they kind of do the spirally thing, and they're sad, and I can't do it, I'm never going to do it, and all of that. That's what we're talking about now. You hit that boss guy, and you get smacked the first time. You hit that, that first hint of the major, you know, epic conflict to come, whether it's an actual fight or if it's just a realization or you know whatever you hit that first bump of that situation and it's got to knock your character on its ass preferably literally because that's so much fun until the character doubts themselves until the character second guesses their choices you know you don't have a good uh, at the end part seven now part seven is a little more complicated than most of the other things because so your character has been knocked on their ass well now you are setting up this whole situation where a they're going to recover from being knocked on their ass or you know recover and then fail again however you're gonna do this this ending thing doesn't matter but they, they, they either recover from it or they think they've recovered from it or whatever. They get whatever it is they need to get to move on to the final, final battle. And you're setting all of that up right here. You know, the princess has been kidnapped again. The love interest has been murdered. Either way, you're at the lowest point in the character's life. They're just, you know, starting to come back up from that point. And you've got to play it. Now, this can be a huge and beautiful section, okay? Beautiful section. Because there's a lot of emotions going on. There's a lot of conflict going on. There's a lot of motivation that can go on. There's a lot of trickery that can go on. Oh, it's so exciting. So you can do a lot of different things with this. And then you move on to section eight. Now, section eight is, of course, the big bad conflict, whatever form that takes. 
okay, it can be in so many different forms. This is the part where, you know, when you get to it in the book, you really want people to be, like, kicking people away, going, no, not right now, it's the climax! You know, no, you, you want it to be intense, you want it to be focused, you want it to be a logical culmination of everything that has happened before. So that's what part eight is. Part nine is the resolution. You're tying up the loose ends, you're explaining the things that may have happened in a rush during the, the final battle, whatever. You know, you're, you're wrapping things up nicely. If it's a series, you might be hinting at things to come or leaving certain things open. But the resolution is where you get that satisfaction in the reader. Everything is all nice and tidy. It's a logical ending. And it doesn't matter, again, how long or short it is. I mean, come on, Tolkien had, what, the story that had 25 endings or something like that? It was ridiculous. And yet, we all, like, sobbed through the entire thing during the movies. Okay, so that's the super basics of this outline situation. And I know what you're thinking now. <laughs> how could I possibly retrofit this after I've already written the story. So you can either use the outline as the internal skeleton for your first draft, or you can take what you've written as your first draft, if you are a pantser, you can take what you've written as your first draft, and you can make sure that your draft, that your, the story that you've written, has an adequate plot arc. And you do this by saying, okay, this, this, this goes in the midpoint. Okay, so you got your story, and you're like, yeah, this goes in the midpoint, and this is climax, and so this goes here, and this goes here, and this goes here. Okay, there's a lot missing right here, so in my second draft, I need to focus on this. There's, you know, way too much in the second half, so maybe I should trim it. What you're looking for is that what you've written fits this story arc. <sighs> Why does anybody give a shit? if these stories fit into the story arc. Have you ever read a story that was, you know, it had a lot of potential, but um, it had a really great story, but the ending was just kind of lacking. The things where there was just something intrinsically wrong with the story. That's what happens. These story arcs did not just come out because, you know, somebody a couple of years ago decided that they were going to make money by telling people they had to fit their stories into these arcs. These story arcs have been in place since the Greeks were writing plays. Okay, the Greeks. And they have had very little modification over the years because that is how people love their stories. That is how our brains love to hear the stories. We need the setup. Yeah. We need the, the, you know, the interesting details. Yeah, we need the twist in the middle. Yeah. We need the, you know, the dip of, of self-confidence. Oh, is it going to happen? Is it not? What, what, what? And then, you know, the final conflict. Oh, well, I am Sparta, whatever. We love the story arc. From the time we are small children, even the way we set up jokes is based on this story arc. It works. And wouldn't you want your story to work? This outline situation and, you know, if the style that I use doesn't work for you, find something else. There are some people who use a three-point outline. There are some people who use a five-point outline. There are some people who use a seven-point outline. There are so many different kinds of outlines out there that follow the same basic structure. Find the style that works for you, but don't ignore the story outline because it is not a restriction. It is an enhancement. It is a tool for authors to use to organize our words. We got words. We have these, I know so many authors who have just beautiful scenes, beautiful, gorgeous scenes, and no 
flippin' story. And it's like, <laughs> just make the story happen so you can share these beautiful scenes with people who will love them. Love them. People want beautiful scenes, but people have to have a good plot. That doesn't mean, like, the, the plot itself is good. That means that the structure of the plot is good. Every massive hit of a movie out there has used these outline structures because they work. Every massive hit of a book has used these outline structures, whether consciously or not, because they work. And I acknowledge, you know, there's some people who just naturally can use these, these outline structures. I mean, like, that's how their brains work. Yay for them! Great! But, how do you know? How do you know that your story is following this, this very functional story structure? Unless you see if it fits into the story structure. It's such a vague story structure, like the story structure thing, you know, it's like midpoint, climax, beginning, you know, we're not talking about it telling you how to write the story. It's literally telling you how to structure your story to make it effective. You can use this either to, you know, write your first draft, which is what I do. My husband says that because of the level of detail that I put into my outlines, my outline actually is my first draft, but if you're a pantser, you don't have to do that. You can take, you can write it all out, and then you can fit that story that you've written into this framework to see what needs to be looked at closer for your second draft. And that's really what's important, right? You know, knowing where to enhance your books knowing where to, you know, tweak your story to make it that much more, you know, of a draw to people. The story structure will help you appeal to the audience. We're, we're very symbiotic with our audience. It's a symbiotic relationship. No, we don't write, okay, I don't write to market, but I pay attention to what my audience loves. Let me know if this has been <laughs> epically confusing. If you want to see more, if you have any questions, put them all in the comments below. Yes, I do pay attention to the comments. I swear. I am currently set up to do three events in March and April. Uh, one of them is Brains to Books SciCon, which is an online convention. So I will be putting links below for that and promoting as more information comes available. I will be doing a table at the local Nebraska Writers Guild, of which I've been a proud member for four or five years now. Totally supportive group, love them to death. I'll also be teaching a class during the conference on picking genre. The third event is Constellation, which is a local comic book anime style convention. Uh, I will be there as part of the Nebraska Writers Guild booth. Uh, we like to do a lot of the local conventions as a group and uh, share our audiences. So that'll be a lot of fun. Don't forget to like this video. Don't forget to ring the bell for notifications of more great videos from Practically Writing and yours truly. Don't forget to follow me on Facebook, Twitter. Don't forget to check out my new swag store, Author Goddess Goodies. I keep adding more stuff. Um, I now have a page for Lena Grace's items. So if you are a fan of the Hot Fae Night series and that kind of stuff, then check all that out. And I'm actually in the process of announcing the first quarterly swag drawing for my patrons on patreon if you want to be a part of that click the link below sign up there is no minimum patronage 
required. A dollar a month will get you entered into these drawings. This quarter, I put up a notebook with the Two Weird cover on it. So, yay! Check that out. Um, the announcements for all of that are public. So if you want to learn more before you sign up, go right ahead. I do have quite a few public posts that you can kind of get a feel of what kind of stuff that I share on my Patreon. Plus a lot of freebies. Oh, dude, lots of freebies. Too Weird is still available on Amazon. Fluffy Bunny the sequel to Too Weird is available on Amazon. I will see you guys in a couple of weeks. Yeah, it's like a three hour class. I'm not doing three hours. Uh -uh. Seriously, I don't have to wear pants. It costs you more if I wear pants. Toodles!